Welcome to the Customer Wins Podcast, where business leaders discuss their secrets and techniques for helping their customers succeed and in turn, grow their business. Hi, I'm Rich Walker, the host of the Customer Wins, where I talk to business leaders about how they help their customers win and how their focus on customer experience leads to growth. Some of our past guests have included Judd Mackerel of Mile Marker and Adam Holt of Asset Map. Today, I get to speak with Aaron Klein, CEO of Nitrogen. And today's episode is brought to you by Quick, the leader in enterprise forms automation. When the last step to earn your client's business requires filling out paperwork, don't ruin a good relationship with a bad experience. Instead, get Quick to make filling out forms a great experience and the easiest part of your transaction. Visit quickforms.com to get started. Now, before I introduce today's guest, I have to give a big thank you to Derek Notman, the founder of Coupler, who also was a guest on this show. Go check out Derek's website at coupler.ai to see how they do financial matchmaking or just watch his episode to hear more. Now, I'm really excited to introduce Aaron Klein, the CEO of Nitrogen, because Aaron co-founded Riskalyze, which has become Nitrogen, in 2011, growing the company to serve tens of thousands of financial advisors and twice being named as one of the world's top 10 most innovative companies in finance by Fast Company Magazines, one of my favorite magazines, by the way. He also co-founded Hope Takes Root, an initiative to serve orphans and sorry, vulnerable kids in Ethiopia. And he serves on the board of Invest in Others, an organization that supports financial advisors who give back to their communities. Investment News has honored him as one of the industry's top 40 under 40 executives. And as I mentioned, Aaron recently led Riskalyze through the evolution of their company to rename it Nitrogen. Aaron, welcome to the Customer Wins. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Super excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you too. Now, if you haven't heard this podcast before, I talk with business leaders about what they're doing to help their customers win, how they built and deliver a great customer experience, and the challenges to growing their own company. So Aaron, I want to understand your business a little bit better. How does your company help people? Sure, absolutely. Well, Nitrogen was founded, and, and it was originally founded as Riskalyze. It's absolutely true. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but Nitrogen was founded back in 2011 with a mission to empower the world to invest fearlessly. Uh, you know, I had uh, done some work in at, at the intersection of finance and technology. My co-founder was a financial advisor, um, and we were just both kind of blown away by how broken investing felt to the average person. Um, it just felt like this black box. They didn't really understand. They put money in. They didn't understand why they got money out, whether it was more money or less money out the other end. And, um, you know, we just felt like uh, there were, there, there had got to be some, some great ways to demystify that and, and uh, create a better experience. And, and the, what's so interesting is that um, humans have this tendency to, uh be more uh, averse to loss, about two and a half times more averse to loss than they are focused on the opportunity for gain. And that drives uh, really strange behavior on the part of human beings when it comes to their investing. Human beings have an absolutely phenomenal ability to sabotage their own investing. And it's because when we see green, we want to buy. When we see red, we want to sell. Like this is just kind of innate in us. And of course, that literally means that we are buying at the high and selling at the low. So, you know, rinse and repeat for 30 years and you will definitely be broke. So it's, uh, you know, we just saw that and, and said, like, there's got to be a better way to empower the world to invest fearlessly. If we, if we can really understand who people are and match them up with an investment portfolio that actually fits who they are, then, you know, it, that is just transformative. And it's going to transform a fearful investor who makes bad decisions into a fearless investor who really makes great decisions and ultimately, what every great financial advisor needs are clients that are willing to make good, fearless decisions, because that's ultimately what financial advisors use to create that long-term financial outcome. So that was that was the core of how the company was founded. And then we, we, the first thing that we invented was this thing called the risk number, where an advisor could take a client through a risk, you know, risk questionnaire, understand who they were as a client and say, you know, hey, Rich, you know, based on your answers here, you're a risk 44. Looks like a speed limit sign on a scale of one to 99. Very intuitive, very easy to understand. You're like, yeah, that feels like me. I, I don't want to speed 90 miles an hour down the freeway. You know, I'd like my portfolio to drive at about 44. Okay, great. 
hey, hey, Rich, like we should probably take a look at how your current portfolio is actually invested. And then something like 88% of the time, your current portfolio would have more risk than you wanted or realized. And your portfolio would come back as like a risk 92. And all of a sudden you're sitting there in front of that financial advisor going, I get it. All of a sudden I get it. I understand why I feel so nervous about what's going on. I'm not in alignment with my portfolio. Now, there's a lot more complexity than that. Obviously, a financial advisor also has to look at how much risk you need to take in order to reach your goals. That's risk capacity. They, they need to think about a variety of different factors. But at the end of the day, like it's a very power, it was a very powerful tool when we rolled that out in 2013 for an advisor to very quickly level set with a client and go, I see the mismatch. Um, and we, over time, like we, so we rolled that out. Uh, you know, we basically named the company after it, right? And then we embarked on this decade of building the growth platform for wealth management firms because we built the tools to, to measure risk capacity. We built the tools to, um, to, to really work through uh, stress testing a portfolio and doing deep portfolio analytics and proposals and investment policy statements and all those kinds of things. And so... Uh, you know, all, all that to say, today, we are working on behalf of financial advisory firms to drive um, pretty much a, a simple process, if you think about it. It's very complex, but, but uh, you know, I, I'm going to make it as simple as possible. You know, we take somebody's leads, which maybe they get from Derek Notman at Coupler, as an example, okay? But maybe they get them from a Snappy Kraken or an FMG, or, you know, maybe they get referrals or whatever. We help people take their leads. We help them accelerate those leads into meetings, and then turn those meetings into valued clients, and then turn those clients into referral champions for their firm. And of course, what comes out the other end, there are assets that flow over into their asset platform, whatever asset platform they use. And, um, and of course, all of this gets dutifully logged in their CRM as their system of record for people along the way. And that's kind of the ecosystem that we've built as the growth platform for wealth management firms. Man, so you guys are doing quite a bit. And, and you reminded me of a story I was reading about an article where a journalist was put embedded in with a bunch of soldiers on the ground. And when the firefighting started, the soldiers ran towards the firefight and the journalist was like, I want to run away from the firefight. <laughs> and you're talking about this, like the advisor needs to run towards the market when it's going red. Right. Great point. And, yeah. And, and so I like this alignment because my wife and I are very different. I don't know if you knew I was a financial advisor. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. And so my aversion to risk is a lot different than my wife's who loves and loves to save. So I'm wondering when you sit down with clients, do they get two different numbers? How do you blend that together? Great and question. How do, you, so, how do you teach them to run towards the fire? <laughs> totally. Well, first of all, I, I, I love the analogy that you just created there because running towards the fire is what financial advisors have got to do. And for some reason, financial advisors have been trained that there are two things that you never talk about with your clients. And it's not religion and politics. Um, it's risk and the short term, right? Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is that human beings react to risk in the short term. That's literally what they do. So these, these, these things that the financial advisor is like, ah, we don't want to talk too much about risk and we don't want to talk about the short term, like keep them long-term focused and blah, blah, blah. And like, we're going to be fine. We're going to have all this great return over the long term. Okay. Um, that is counterproductive to the financial advisor's success because inevitably, difficulties in the market, you know, points of volatility are going to arrive in the market and it's going to undermine your entire message and undermine your credibility as a financial advisor with what you do for your clients. So you're absolutely right. Financial advisors have got to run towards that fire in different ways. We have built the ability for advisors to uh, send out multiple questionnaires. So you can do multiple opinions there and you can send one, one to each spouse and, and, you know, and what's super fascinating is that sometimes they'll come back and by the way, these often defy gender stereotypes. So like I, I, I've, I've seen, in fact, the average female uh, answering a risk question on our platform, this is a little bit of guesswork because uh, we're using name matching to try to estimate it. But if, if, if names had a gender meaning, okay, um, mm -hmm. we actually found that the average female on our platform was about six or seven risk numbers higher than the average male answering right. a risk question. I was a little bit surprised too, um, wow. because the stereotype, you know, like falls apart, you know, when, when you kind of put some data to it, but, um, but all that to say, um, when, you know, you can come back and, and one spouse is a 29 and the other spouse is a 72. 
And it's a great opportunity for the financial advisor to say, now listen, I'm a, I'm a financial advisor. I'm not a marriage counselor. We're going <laughs> to need to have a conversation about this. And we either need to, you know, think about managing your different, you know, IRAs differently or something like that, or we need to kind of compromise here and decide what kind of target. And by the way, this is where risk capacity can really come into play, because if it turns out that one spouse is 24 and the other 72, and our risk capacity tells us that we kind of need to be invested like a 55, we might be able to use that as a driver towards compromise for, mm -hmm. for these two spouses and say, okay, I can get, you know, the, the spouse who's a risk 24 says I can get comfortable with, with that portfolio because I get that we need to do it in order to reach our goals. And the spouse who's a 72 says, okay, that's great. We don't have to take as much risk as I thought we needed to in order to reach our goals. Like, let's go for it. I think one of the important things you're saying, though, is that it, it, maybe you intended this or not, you're getting these people to talk more. You're getting yes. them to articulate more of what their fear is, what their challenges are, what their goals are, right? And that's one of the biggest challenges a financial advisor faces is getting people to actually talk. Totally right. I, I, I've... I'm sure you've probably heard of this before. Um, there's this thing, a few different people have written about it. One of them, one of my favorite books on the subject is Donald Miller's book about storytelling. Have you heard about the oh, storytelling yeah. framework? Yeah, yeah. Story, build your story brand. Yeah. And so like the storytelling framework is renowned because basically, you know, the idea here is like, we always want to make ourselves the hero of the story. Um, and financial advisors are not the hero of the story. They've got to make Yoda. that the hero of the story. They're, yeah, exactly. They're Obi-Wan Kenobi or Yoda or you know whichever character there that is the guide to kind of helping the, the, the client kind of get to the other side. And you know the, the challenge is, is so many financial advisors see themselves as the hero of the story because after all, the client is coming to them saying, can you use your expertise to help me get to a better place? And, and there's incredibly noble work that financial advisors are doing to help empower millions of people to actually help their grandkids go to college and retire with security and dignity and and create like life-changing nonprofit work out there that would that that would not happen without the work of financial advisors so they're heroes in my book but they can't make themselves the hero of the story because if you're the hero of the story and you look around and you say where's my client guess what your client is sitting on the couch eating popcorn OK, <laughs> they're sitting there asking, is this an entertaining story right now or not? And when the market gets volatile, all of a sudden that's not an entertaining story anymore and they want to turn you off. OK, yeah. so it's so critically important to make the client be the hero of the story and you put yourself into the role of guide. And I would argue that creating those conversations and that buy in on these decisions is the critical way that you're making the client the hero of the story. When the client has said, yes, I agree, we should manage this like a risk 55. Okay, great. Now let's talk about that. Now, if you look at this portfolio, a risk 55 portfolio, like the one you're talking about, this would be normal behavior for this portfolio. In six months from now, it could be down X percent. It could be up Y percent. That would be normal. Okay. Are you okay with that? Because I'm looking over at the spouse who's a 24 and I'm like, that's more risk than you're typically <laughs> comfortable with. Okay. Yeah. You've got to promise me that if we agree to do a 55, you're not going to run in and say, sell, sell, sell as soon as we go to the red number here, because it's going to happen. And then I'll, I'll give you one worse. There's 5% of the risk we can't quantify for you. That's things like pandemics and inflation crashes. I mean, we've had so many of them in the 2020s already. It's not even funny. Right. Yeah, right. But but like I'm going to I'm going to pull up the nitrogen stress test and I'm going to show you right here that, you know, like this is the kind of risk you have in like a 5% probability. But if your portfolio was to relive the 2022 inflation crash or the 2008 financial crisis. So these are the conversations we have to have so that clients can be bought into the process and say, yeah, I made that decision. I understood the balance between risk and reward. I took that risk and my financial advisor is helping me navigate through this set of decisions that I own. Yeah, man, that is so powerful. And you know, one of the questions I want to ask is, you know, how you're helping your customers win, but it's so obvious. You're helping mm -hmm. your advisors have better communication and conversations. And, and you know, often I've, I've thought of financial advisement as 95% psychology, was what mm -hmm. do you do when the market's up or down and how do you treat oh, people's sure. reactions to it, right? Yeah, And what you've done is you've given them a number. You've kind of boiled it down and distilled it to this fine point where they can categorize themselves. Yeah. You know, actually, <laughs> one of the ways to get through to toddlers 
is to label things. It's the same thing with negotiation too. You label sure. it. You yeah. feel like your number helps clients label their fear, label their acceptance yes. of risk. No, I think that's absolutely right. And, and one thing I've told many financial advisors, you know, we don't ever tell financial advisors what they should advise their clients. We just help their clients see and understand the things that financial advisors have been telling them for years, right? Yeah. And so that's exactly right because it creates a language that allows the, the person to say, well, listen, like, I would be really nervous. I see what you're saying here. That that particular example that we were just saying, the 24, the, the spouse who's a risk 24 might honestly say, listen, I hear what you're saying. I get that we need to be at 55, but I am really uncomfortable with this. Like if our portfolio in a six month period ever dropped that number, like I'd be like, we have to sell. That would be my position. And so, you know, my question would be, what would, what would it look like if we met in the middle and we were a risk 38, Okay. Hey, that's a fair question. Yeah. Now what we need to do is we need to, to look at the portfolio that would be at risk 38 and say, how does that impact our goals? Okay. And if that means that we size our goals down a little bit, maybe we were, maybe we retire a little bit later. Maybe we don't buy the vacation house for a few more years. Maybe this, maybe that, but we change some of those goals. And all of a sudden the, the risk 24 spouse, you know, looks over at the risk 72 spouse and says, listen, I get that you're comfortable with this, but like, I would feel I would sleep so much better at night if we could follow this plan instead of that plan. And like, couldn't we put off the vacation house for four more years and I sleep better at night? And, you know, like that could be a really good compromise between two spouses. This mm -hmm. is and think about the level of value that that financial advisor is driving by getting that couple to the point that they can have that conversation and, and come to that conclusion as a couple. Like that's that's very powerful. You you feel like you've gotten a lot of value out of that financial advisor meeting, that's for sure. I already know I need to get my advisor to use your tool. Um, <laughs> keep my wife and I talking better about this. This is There great. you go. Label so it. Let's, let me shift gears a little bit because I read a little bit about how you started your company. In the first couple of years, it wasn't working the way you wanted. And then yeah. you shifted your focus and I think you said you started focusing on financial advisors as your client, and that's when things started to take off, right? Yep. Yep. I have a question about that. Well, I what, yeah, just to set you up, like we what really happened is that we started the company, we wanted to work with financial advisors from day one, but we were afraid. We were hmm. afraid that great financial advisors weren't going to leverage brand new risk technology because that was the first thing we were building, was kind of the risk framework. And we're like, great financial advisors are not going to use brand new risk technology on their clients. We have to figure out how to validate this. So we had this five-year plan for validating it with consumers and then bringing it to financial advisors. And it did not work. But we can go oh, into wow. that. Based, yeah, based wow. on where you can go. Okay. Well, I, I look, I, I run a B2B company and I do yeah. enterprise sales. And I found it incredibly hard to sell to the financial advisor, to the, mm -hmm. to the independent user. So I'm wondering, how did you do that? How did you yeah. grow so fast with that market? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so, so we started off with this, you know, thesis of like, okay, five-year plan, like we're going to validate with the consumers and we're going to make money by uh, licensing this technology to the self-directed brokers for them to leverage with like the $25,000 E-Trade guy um, right. or something like that. And um, it's going to, it's going to drive like uh, that kind of investor to be more in alignment with who they want to be and like figure out their stock trades to match. And so that's what we were kind of building at the very beginning with an eye towards like turning this into an advisor platform down the road. And we had actually circled 2015 on the calendar. Like that's when we were going to be an advisor product for the first time, 2015. So uh, somewhere in the middle of two, I actually was like Labor Day 2012. So it was near the end of 2012. We had just exhausted that consumer strategy. Now, I'll, I'll be clear. It was 2012. I like to call it our year of successful failure because we did launch the product out there and consumers loved it. So we got some PR. We were in the New York Times, Barron's, NPR. We we had you know users come on and build like twenty seven billion dollars in 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 portfolios on that consumer tool. Average account size like twenty twenty six thousand dollars or something like that. So it was sorry, I got that wrong. It was two billion dollars, but it was average account size twenty seven thousand dollars. That's what it was. Okay. 
So it was enough traction that we were like, okay, there's $2 billion of validation on here, $27,000 average account size. We nailed our E-Trade guy, like, but we can't get, uh, you know, in hindsight, there were only five potential customers at the time on the face of planet earth, like Fidelity, Schwab, E-Trade, Scott Trade. Who am I missing? Fidelity, Schwab. I can't remember. TD Ameritrade at the time, no. right? So like uh, uh, this is consolidated since, right? And two of those players are gone. So now there's only three. Um, but at the time there were five and, and, you know, we, for the life of us could not get like some of them just flat out. They're like, Oh, we don't work with outside partners for our retail technology. We just don't do that. Um, you know, a couple of them were super interested in, in working together. One of them, like we almost got that contract done and then they had all these technology problems and they couldn't make it work. So it's the typical kind of like big enterprise, you know, I, there, come back to sure. us in six quarters and we'll be ready to go, you know? And we're like, well, we've got three months of money left in the bank. Like this yeah, is right. going to work <laughs> out, you know? And so, um, so suffice it to say, we kind of sat down Labor Day weekend of 2012 and I'm like, I'm like, what do we have on the ship that's good? I like to call it the Apollo 13 question. Like, what do we have on the ship that's good? And I could write down like, you know, great core technology and $2 billion of validation. And so I was like, you know, uh, team, like if we're going to, and we were a little team of like three, four people. I'm like, if we're going to go down, like, let's go down swinging. Let's rebuild the product for financial advisors right now. And let's see if financial advisors won't buy into the $2 billion of validation. And so lo and behold, they did. We rolled out the advisor product in 2013, two years, three years earlier than we expected. And, um, you know, early 2013, we kind of came out of beta and it just took off like a rocket. Um, hmm. But it was interesting because probably in November of 2012, I met with an entrepreneur in the space, really nice, like generous guy, generous with his time. And he was, you know, building a business that more served the asset management side of the space. And he said, oh, man, he goes, you don't want to serve financial advisors. They're, they're super cheap. They cancel products all the time. They're really hard to sell to. They're very demanding, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like he had this long list of things. And you know, there was a little like part of, I think they call it the lizard brain that was just telling me, oh no, like maybe this is not a good bet. Like maybe this is not a good plan. But I'd met a lot of financial advisors and I just had this inkling that like they needed better tools, that 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 they made a really deep impact on people. And I was like, I'll bet you that we can build, we had a really good culture in our little organization of three or four people. And um, we, we, we had this like, you know, never say die kind of mentality and also a very like customer slash user focused first mentality, like really thinking about the customer first and working backwards from there. And so I was like, I just feel like we can create a company that serves financial advisors, you know, and, and they are, they are demanding by the way. And, and they, they have high expectations, but I'm like, I think we can build an organization where we have higher expectations for ourselves than they have of us. And I think that could allow us to be successful with financial advisors. And so lo and behold, um, you know, that's exactly what we did. Um, and we, we went out there to the marketplace and it just took off like a rocket. When you give financial advisors something that actually drives big growth in their businesses, um, that's a recipe for success for financial advisors. And my only regret, and, you know, I know we'll talk about this maybe in a little bit, is that we spent a decade being known as Riskalyze, named after the first feature that we built, when the truth is, is that we've been building this growth platform for, for wealth management firms for the last decade, and we've kind of been hiding it in plain sight. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm super excited about our next decade because now the core benefit of what we actually drive for, for wealth management firms is like out there for everybody to see. Man, no, it's such a great story, Aaron. And you know, we're we're actually in the throes of launching a new product this fall, and we've been debating: yeah. is it a quick product? Is, is it under that brand, or is it a new product, new brand? And we realize it's part of the quick family. It's the same kind of core concept of what we do, but a new way of doing things. But right. it's a really challenging question to ask. And I want to come back and talk to you about why you changed your name to Nitrogen. But first, I have to ask a different question. Yeah, sure. You you keep saying that you did two billion dollars worth of validation, and I'm wondering. If you had never done that level of validation, do you think your company would have taken off? Do you think if you had switched to financial advisors, you would have even earned the first customer? It's a great question. I'm not sure that we would have. Um, financial advisors, 
I mean, maybe I, the question is just like on earth two, what would have happened if we didn't do the validation? Like it's really hard to ever predict what would have happened on earth two. Um, I, 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 I kind of doubt it because I think financial advisors, you know, it, and you've been one. So like, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, but like the, the, there are two things. I, I, sometimes I think our entire company is a little bit of a miracle. Okay. And, and here's what I mean by that. I think that every time I've, I've talked to a financial advisor, put myself in their shoes, it feels like there's two things that are the most precious things in a financial advisor's life. The first is the client review. Okay. Because mm -hmm. if they, if they have a bad client review, Okay. The, the client just goes, I have entrusted my life savings to this person. And like, they just really fumbled. Like they are fumbling the ball and they don't know what they're talking about. I don't think I can trust them anymore. Bam. ACAP form money gone. Okay. Revenue gone, client gone. Like it's that, it's that simple. Like you can't afford one stumble client review. Like, like most, most precious thing. The second most precious thing in a financial advisor's life, I think is the prospect meeting. Like, this is my shot. I'm not going to get a ton of these at-bats. And I've got a meeting with a prospect. And this is my shot to do real growth in my firm. And it might be my shot this quarter. I mean, some firms do four meetings, four prospect meetings a year. Okay. Right. Some right. of them do one a month. Okay. It's not like I'm getting tons of at-bats and it's like baseball. And it's like, well, if I'm batting 333, like I am absolutely phenomenal okay like i feel like i've got a small number of at bats and i need to treat each one with a, a, a precious you know like like i need to be very very um they're fragile and i need to be very very cautious with these so our company is a little bit of a miracle because the only thing that we ask you to do to adopt the nitrogen process in your firm is to disrupt the number one and number two most precious things that you do in well, your that's firm all. that's all that's all <laughs> Right. You know, you just have to change how you're doing your client review to weave this really powerful set of visuals and conversation into your client review. Um, and, you know, I, again, the good news for us is that I think we've built something that's so simple and intuitive and easy to use that the financial advisor goes, I can do this. Like, I can do this. I'll do a little bit of training and like, I can do this and I'm not going to fumble and I'm not going to stumble and I'm not going to, it's going to make my client meeting better. And it's probably got a, 8x chance of making it better than causing me to stumble. So like, I think that's that's been our saving grace. And then for the prospect meetings, they can see the power of being able to, you know, the, the average financial advisor prospect meeting, you know, this is about building trust and credibility. And when all you've got to do that are kind of like some stories and gleaming photos of your family on the credenza behind you, and hopefully your financial advisor has a family. Otherwise, you have to hire people to be in the photos and the you know of of, of the of the. Yeah, family. I, I still don't know how I got my first client. <laughs> <laughs> right, like yeah. that's the thing, and so so it's it's it, it's so powerful when you can shift the conversation to building trust with data. Right. Because if the client tells you they're a 44 and then you're the one who shows them they're invested like a 92, all of a sudden they're like, I'm learning something here. I never understood. I innately felt, but I haven't been able to put my finger on. And you showed it to me. You've got it going on. And that's you what give, builds trust and credibility with advisors. You give those advisors the opportunity to have clarity with their customers, which is yeah. super, super important. So I'm just, I, I mean, don't answer this. It's kind of a funny question, but did you give the advisor their own risk number on their ability to perform in those two jobs? <laughs> That's funny. That's a funny, I had never even thought about that idea before. That's very funny. Um, no, but, but I would, you know, what I also found very humorous is that as you know, full well, there are financial advisors actually trying to grow. And then there are financial advisors who are simply trying to, they're thinking about growth differently. They simply don't want to shrink. Okay. They want to keep yeah. the clients that they've got, keep them very happy, very satisfied. And they want to do very, very moderate growth, if any new client growth. And I figured this out when I was Nitrogen's own, at the time, Riskalyze's own only salesperson. I'm talking to a financial advisor on the phone, grizzled old guy. And I'm about halfway through, like showing him like how this can help him grow his business. He's like, son, I could use another client. Like I could use a hole in the head. And, <laughs> and I, you know, I, my brain's spinning on that for a second. I'm like, well, let me show you 
how we can help you get out on the golf course every day by 2.30, guaranteed. He goes, now you're talking, son. Keep going. <laughs> you know, and, and just talking about how if your clients can see and understand these things that you've been telling them for years and they know what to expect in their portfolio, they're not calling you at four right. in the afternoon saying, we're down 3%. Am I okay? They now yeah. know what is normal for their portfolio. And so, you know, I, I it's so interesting that you said that because- those are those are the the advisors you might say were a little bit higher risk, but they they grabbed onto it as well because they're like, if my clients can see and understand, this is a better life, not just for them, but for me too. Yeah. Well, look, I want to summarize a point that you made, which is, or I, I was asking about to see if it was important. A lot of businesses fail to validate what they're doing, and financial advisors do the same. I, I mean, yeah. I was in that boat before I left financial planning. I thought, oh, I'm going to be the next Susie Orman. I'm going to write books. I'm going to do workshops and seminars. Right. And you, you really have to test these theories out. And I think the fact that you did it with a different market, so to speak, and learned from that and had enough foresight to switch and say, now let's take these learnings and apply it to an actual market that can pay you. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's, in hindsight, I think it's genius. And I think it's really, really uh, introspective of you and your team to have made that pivot at that moment. Thank you. In hindsight, we also felt it was genius. At the time, we were just, it was called desperation. You know, oh, I anyway. know. It's like, <laughs> save the ship. Go that way. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, let's talk about your success in a different light. I mean, you have sure. 10 years, 12 years. I, I'm not doing the math right. Yeah, that's probably um, right. You've, been, you, you've certainly bucked the trend of being able to survive as a company beyond most entrepreneurs. But now you've come to that phase where you said, let's rebrand. Yeah. And tell me about that. How hard was that decision to come to? Why is it important to you guys to rebrand? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I honestly never thought we would. Um, I spent probably the last six years, I have like a list of questions I'd like to, uh, you know, like think about. I kind of, you, you know, like make this list and I, I spend, it gets a little quiet between Christmas and New Year's. And I generally kind of try to spend that time like thinking about those kinds of questions. So I think like probably six years in a row, I thought about, um, should we rebrand the company? I'm like, because everybody just thinks that we're risk tolerance documentation questionnaire. Like that's what people think we are. And, you know, um, a very wise person said to me very recently, they're like, you know, branding, uh, and I've learned this to be true, branding is such a double-edged sword. If you do it poorly, you can change your brand to mean anything you want it to mean. If you do a really good job of it, you are stuck in the box that you've created for yourself. So I don't know the details of your new product, but if, you know, I would, I would argue to you, like, I know the quick brand. And I know that quick means a great experience, like getting paperwork done quickly. OK, um, quickly. Um, and so if you know, if your new product is 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 has a different benefit or a broader goal than that, it probably is going to be a challenge for people to understand that quick provides it. If it's in that family of work, like it's going to actually just like the brand is just going to propel that new product in a really powerful way. So that's what we found is we had a brand that was not propelling our work. It was actually like stereotyping it back. And somebody said, it's as if Jeff Bezos named his company onlinebookstore.com. Like that was right. a great name for V1 <laughs> of Amazon. Not a great name for V2 <laughs> of Amazon, you know? And so, uh, so yeah, it was a tough decision. It was such a tough decision. But my, my you know, our, our new chief marketing officer came in with the data to show like, like we are, we are talking to these large firms and they go, well, I mean, of course we've heard of you. You have a great reputation. Many of our advisors love you. We don't even really understand it because like, we don't need another risk tolerance documentation tool around here. Like that, that's, we don't need to do that as a firm. Right. So they didn't understand right. that it was a growth platform to drive firm-wide growth in a wealth management firm. They thought of it as just a risk tolerance documentation tool. Um, and so so anyway, it was fascinating. The data was very clear on that. Um, we so we just decided like we've we've got to rip this bandaid off. We've got to do it, and we undertook this long effort. I mean, first of all, we spent time with a firm called Lexicon Branding, and this is a storied firm that has named a bunch of the great brands in our world. Sonos, Impossible Burger, Febreze, Swiffer, Subaru Forester, PowerBook, Pentium for Intel, like uh, just some Man. amazing names, okay? 
Um, they came out when they came up with like 40 different names for us uh, to review. They present them all to you, by the way, on a white slide with black letters because they don't want you to be like, you know, uh, tilted by color design right? or something yeah. like that. Right. So I, there were some, you know, really intriguing ones. There were some absolutely horrible ones. The worst one, you know, I've shared before was was Green Flash, which felt to me like a mix between like the Incredible Hulk and the Sex Offenders list or something like that. <laughs> it was just like Green Flash, like like just not good. But you know that there's some doozies that they've hidden in there just to, you know, to like, oh, that's the one we're going to reject. Like that's the one yeah. they're going to reject. We know that's it. I'm pretty sure Green Flash was that one. But Nonetheless, like, um, you know, there were, there were, there were, uh, there were some really good ones, but when nitrogen came up on the screen, we're like, oh my gosh, like that is it. We just have to have it. Like it's the essential element for growth on our planet. It's a force multiplier. It's a catalyst that drives growth. And so, um, you know, that is what we do for wealth management firms. And so the response to it has been really great. And I'll tell you, um, you know, on the one hand, if there, if there's been any negative response, it's been solo advisors who would use the Riskalyze brand with their clients. Mm. And, and they're like, I don't really know if the nitrogen brand like fits that as well. And I'm like, well, listen, we still own the Riskalyze brand. You can continue to use the term Riskalyze with your clients. It's still our brand. You can do that. Okay. You can also consider using nitrogen. But honestly, like we actually design neither of those brands. Like you're our audience. We yeah, design right. neither of those brands to be client facing. We actually designed the risk number brand to be client facing. Notice that our logo has never been in it so that you can kind of slide it in under your branding and make it make it work really well for you. This sounds so, like a great opportunity to talk to your clients more and yeah. actually help them evolve too, which is such a good outcome from this. Great They're point. going to use your brand even better now. Yeah, great point. And so, you know, so there's that. I the other the other thing that surprised me on the other end of the spectrum, larger firms are absolutely loving this because they're like, we have a different problem. We're trying to drive adoption of your technology by advisors. And so we go out to advisors and say, you we want you to use Riskalyze. And they're like, oh, another compliance tool, you know, more oh, risk man. documentation, right? And, yeah. and now they go, we go out and say, hey, we want you to use nitrogen to help drive growth in your practice and in our firm. And people are like, let's go. So it's been really great for driving kind of enterprise class firm-wide adoption uh, by firms so far in these first few weeks uh, post-rebrand. So did you get the license fast and furious and show the nitrous boost to, <laughs> uh, just kidding. <laughs> We're thinking about it. We're thinking about it. Yeah. We have to think about a race car painted purple or something like that. There you go. Well, Aaron, I love that you're you're thinking this way. Uh, a lot of brands struggle with this. A lot of companies struggle with this. And it's really nice to see a company do this well. Thank you. Uh, let's talk about the future a little bit, because I want to bring yeah. up one of my favorite topics, artificial sure. intelligence. Yeah. And I want to ask you, and, and please, let's not, let's not go down the rabbit hole too far, because we could talk all day, I'm sure. We could. But how do you see AI changing or impacting your customer experience? I, and great. just by the way, I mean, we have a customer who is yeah. trying to do AI sentiment analysis to, to watch people's reaction to risk questions so they could figure out, oh no, they think they're high risk, they're low risk or whatever. So I'm really curious how you see AI impacting yeah. your business. Yeah, I, I, I'm a bit skeptical of that of that kind of AI. Like like the the we're gonna look at people's faces and and determine. I mean, like people have been using poker faces um, or you know or, <laughs> or or frankly overemphasizing um, their emotions and wearing their emotions on their sleeve one way or the other for decades um, to you know centuries, maybe even millennia. Uh, to to you know for for different reasons and sometimes we do that without even knowing that we do that um, just because we want to keep our cards close to our chest or we want to shift this person's perception of us in a different way so I think that's a that's 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 kind of like the next um, generation of an old idea which is we're going to figure out your risk tolerance by attaching you know data aggregation to your brokerage account and seeing if you ever sold a stock after it went down well maybe they made a very reasoned calm rational decision maybe they had a stop loss already put in three months ago like who knows yeah right. like oh, we're so, so I, i'm skeptical of that i'm very skeptical of that now i am wildly bullish on ai just as as a platform shift and as a technology layer because so we actually shipped nitrogen ai just like one tiptoe into that um with the ability to you know in our as part of our advisor marketing kit you can generate blog posts tweets and other kinds of content um you know using uh, an ai model trained on tons of advisor content 
Um, and you can use like all kinds of topics. So you type in the topics you want and you can say, here's the tone, here's the demographic I'm shooting for, and here's the kind of content I'm looking for. And actually, I will generate a first draft for you. And we look at that and say, it's not going to write it for you. But, you know, what advisors say is, well, I don't have time and I have writer's block. Well, we can solve 100% of the writer's block and 80% of the time because now you're an editor yeah. instead of a, a writer for the blank sheet of paper. So I think that's super cool. I think AI is going to really, really save us a lot of, of clicks and really save us a lot of manually entering data. Because I think what's going to happen is the, the, the machine is just going to get smarter and smarter and smarter about probably what you want to do. And then it's still going to be human driven decisions, confirming and editing and tweaking and um, not just doing as much creation from scratch. And how cool is that day going to be? Yeah, no, for sure. Well, I think that's a great way to look at it. Um, and, and it's nice to hear that you're putting stuff into your product because like I use chat GPT all the time to write yeah. things. My wife's launching a business. So we've been using it to come up with even brand names. That's so much wow, fun. Wow, that's cool. That's awesome. I treat it like a personal assistant. a little bit cheaper than what I did for my brand name. But uh, I don't but know if it's as effective, call. but- <laughs> Well, we'll find out. We'll find out. That's good. So Aaron, as we wrap this up, I do have another question for you. But sure. before I ask it, what is the best way for people to connect with you? Sure. Um, well, I, I, I'm on Twitter, um, at Aaron Klein on Twitter, um, and uh, on LinkedIn as well, and love connecting with people. Um, you know, if you want to learn a little bit more about nitrogen, we're nitrogenwealth.com. And, um, you know, and also I just love like hearing from great financial advisors and, and great business leaders and entrepreneurs. And so um, I'm, I'm good on email as well. I'm ak at nitrogenwealth.com, easy to reach. Awesome. All right, man, you shared so many really great things and stories with us, but I, here's my last question. Yeah. Who has had the biggest impact on your leadership or how you approach your role? Ah, such a great question. And um, I, I've got to, I have, I find it really hard to get it down to one person. So I'm just going to, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to, I'm going to answer basically two people. So the first would be my dad. Um, I started working for my dad at the age of 12 in the afternoons after school. And you know, very different business, not the software business, very low margin distribution kind of company. Um, and as a result, I learned from him just a couple of things, like the grit that it takes to be an entrepreneur. Um, I learned from him that relationships are just everything in business. If you take care of your clients, they will take care of you. Um, and we try to keep that very much in mind with um, our customer driven value at Nitrogen and being being really, really focused on um, how to make sure that we're driving like 10x value to the customer compared to what we're capturing. Um, so, so I think that's number one. The other person I call it a really great mentor of mine, um, uh, a guy named Phil. And here's what I learned from Phil. He was about to sell his business. And I said, oh, so you're going to retire. He goes, no. He goes like, human beings are not meant to retire. I'm going to refocus. My refocusment is I'm going to spend some time working on like nonprofit work with orphans and like working on this thing, these things with my church and like, like this. And so I just look at that and I I've been very inspired by that as well. And uh, so my dad and Phil, my mentor, um, two, two great uh, individuals who have really uh, inspired me in, uh, in some great ways. Oh, that is awesome. I, you know, that reminds me of my mentor because his definition of retirement was the ability to do what you want, where you want, when you want, how you want hopefully with whom you want, but it can't help you there. Yeah, there you um, go. So it is about refocus. That's so, such a great view. Um, man, this has just been awesome. So look, I want to say thank you to Aaron Klein, CEO of Nitrogen, for being on this episode of The Customer Wins. Go check out Aaron's website at nitrogenwealth.com. And don't forget to check out quick at quickforms.com, where we take the work out of paperwork. I hope you've enjoyed this discussion. We'll click the like button, share this with someone, and subscribe to our future channels. Uh, sorry, our channel for future episodes of The Customer Wins. Aaron, it was fantastic having you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to The Customer Wins Podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.